So today I start the process of properly sizing the heating and cooling equipment for our building. Now that starts with a calculation and it's called either a heat loss or a heat gain calculation. We need to know how much heat we need to put back into the building on the coldest day. Now you start with what they call design conditions and they, they differ all around the world and so it's how warm do we want it inside the building. So let's call it 70 degrees versus how cold will it get on the coldest day. So around here in New England for round numbers we're going to say zero degrees. So that's about a 70 degree temperature difference between inside and outside. Now the bigger the temperature difference between those two points, the more the heat inside the building wants to just drive through. So every single wall surface, every single window has a given number about how fast it'll let that heat pass through. Now heat gain is for the cooling side of it. Cooling side is similar. It's how warm will it be on a hot summer day versus how cool do we want inside the building. And we're going to use for our calculations 9575, about a 20 degree temperature difference between those two. So we come to the building, we look at how many square feet of exposed walls, how many windows, how much roof surface, and we put in the type of insulation that's in there. So if we use standard insulation, fiberglass or cellulose in a two by four wall, basic windows, my heat loss calculation comes out with an interesting number. It shows about 53,000 BTUs. Now think of these candies as BTUs. Each one is a unit of energy. I counted these, it took a long time. 53,000 is what you need to replace each hour, whenever it was zero degrees outside, to put back into the building to replace what was being lost through the wall ceilings and windows. So, if we step up our insulation to this net zero level, as we are, high performance insulation, rigid, high performance glass, really tight, the number drops down to just below 30,000 BTUs. So now that means smaller equipment, smaller heating and cooling to replace it on the coldest day of the year. 52,999. All right, so here is a model of our house. The street is right here. The original building was right about here and we're adding on this part. And we really have to start thinking about the siting of the house, where it is in relation to the sun. So north is here, south is here. This side facing the street is west. Think about the effect of the sun during the course of a given day. The sun comes up in the morning, shines onto this east side. So on the east side there's no real overhangs. The sun's intensity is not that strong, let the light flood in. So in the summer, as the sun gets higher in the sky and to the south, you've got to actually worry about too much solar gain coming into the building. So these overhangs are a really important part of good design. The Prairie Architects knew all about this, but many modern developers and builders seem to have forgotten about it. Look at this. I mean, the sun's not getting to that window right there, and that's good. Now, in the winter, the sun comes up, but it stays lower in the sky, so now those overhangs don't work against you. You can get some contribution here on that south side and you want that in the winter. So that's passive solar gain around the building, but we're also using the sun's energy to make electricity for our net zero house. But look at the building. There is no logical place that faces a roof south on this building. So we've added a barn behind the building and that roof is gonna face exactly south. And we've got solar panels represented here. We'll cover that roof almost exactly, making that look like the roof itself. It can be hardly noticeable. Now, another thing that can affect this building is wind. In the summer, the prevailing breeze is from the south and west, and that's right about here. So you look, it's going to blow into that south side. That'll cool off some of the sun's effect, and that's an advantage. But in the winter, that very cold wind switches to the north and west, okay? So now you're going to have incredibly cold air pushing against every window, every seam, every place the two materials come together and you worry about cold air coming into the building. But you also worry about another thing and that is this air goes around the building and reattaches like going around an airplane's wing and it pulls and it will do exfiltration. It will try to pull air out of these windows as well. It's almost like we've got a clear plastic bubble over this house. So what happens now if you're on a bath fan or a kitchen range hood trying to take air from inside the building to out? Where's the air going to come from? All right, so I've connected a vacuum cleaner to the underside of our house model. I want to simulate 
what happens with a super tight house when a bath fan or a kitchen hood comes on. And you see what happens. It starts to look for air anywhere it can, and if it can't find it, it's going to pull in to any opening it might find. And look what happens at that window right there. The building's under a negative pressure. It's trying to find the air from somewhere. So it might find it in a normal house through a dryer vent opening, through another kitchen range hood, any opening that's inside the building to try and relieve this negative pressure. So in most jurisdictions, you need a way to have balanced ventilation. The same amount of air coming in as goes out. So if you have a fan like this, you should have at least a damper that would open automatically any time a fan came on. Now this would open up, but why would you want to do this to bring ice cold air in the winter into this super insulated building or in the summer to bring highly humid air into this tight building. So this it might be good in some places, but anytime we have a building this well insulated, the only way to do it, in my opinion, is a balanced ventilation called an energy recovery ventilator. So here is fresh air being able to be drawn inside to the building across this core and goes into the building. But at the very same time, stale air from kitchens and bathrooms, et cetera, come this way, go across this core this way. What happens is in the winter, the heat you've already gotten paid for is transferred to the incoming cold air to pre-temper the air going into the building. In the summer, just the opposite, that highly humid air from outside, the humidity gets kept outside the building, doesn't let it go in. Another scourge of a super tight building without ventilation is moisture. What happens after you take a long shower or boil a big pot of spaghetti? Watch this. So you see that moisture right there? What can happen is moisture can form on any interior surface. And anytime you have the presence of moisture and temperature, it's a perfect breeding ground for mold. And that is a house killer. So the important lesson is if you're going to insulate, you got to ventilate. It's a further reminder that a modern comfort system is indeed a system. You need to have both sides right, the right size equipment, and plenty of fresh air to be comfortable. Somebody been eating these? Somebody take my BTUs? Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.